Ena iwi nati fatua, ena iwi o te motu, ena reo, ena mana, ena rangatira mā tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Talo falava, malo elelei, whakalofa lahi atu, kia ana ni sambula vanaka, and warm Pacific greetings to you all. Beverly Lady Reeves, uh, Peter, Bob, everyone connected with uh, uh, Leadership New Zealand, our hosts AUT, and all friends who are here tonight, and I see a lot of uh, familiar faces. And thank you for inviting me to come to give the Bishop Sir Paul Reeves a memorial uh, lecture. And I will start with saying a few words about Paul, as my association with him went back to when I was a cabinet minister in the 1980s, and Paul was governor general. And he was, as we all know, a, a very strong character, and he'd made his mark in the Anglican Church, rising to the top position of Archbishop and Primate uh, of New Zealand. And I often felt that perhaps Paul felt just a wee bit, or maybe quite a lot, constrained by the role of Governor General. Uh, but uh, what a wonderful job he did, and he had my lifetime respect for his determination to make a difference for people, and he kept on making it from the church through being Governor General uh, through to all those roles uh, after uh, leaving public office uh, at Government House, uh, not least as Chancellor of this university, uh, also in the service of the Commonwealth, uh, helping with mediation around issues in Fiji, issues in Guyana, in the north of the South American continent, representing the Anglican Church at the United Nations, so many other causes, his iwi, of course, he did great uh, service for. And I was very honoured when I went up to New York to take up this position, that Paul came up with a delegation of senior Māori leaders to support me and to sort of offer me over to the United Nations, as it, as it were. And uh, people still talk six and a bit years later of how exciting the ceremony was because there's been a funny tradition in the UN that when people go there, they somehow leave their culture behind and take on a, a bland UN identity. And this wonderful ceremony that uh, uh, was devised uh, to present me got people thinking, why do we do that? This was so incredible, so authentic to have people come uh, and present. Uh, I also remember Parakura Horomia, I think it was, saying in, in his speech at this gathering, he said, and if you people don't treat Helen well up here, we're coming back to get her. <laughs> So I'm hoping Parikura still has powers of telepathy <laughs> from somewhere. Um, but uh, one of my great regrets is that I could not myself uh, attend Paul's tangi because uh, I think it was within a day or two of his passing away, my mother passed away, and I remember ringing you, Beverly, and saying, I'll have to be with my own whanau uh, for, for now. But uh, it was a special time to see Paul not long before, before he went. So, what a wonderful man to name a lecture series uh, after. And the theme, I understand, for the programs of Leadership New Zealand this year is fearless leadership, a description which certainly uh, can be applied to Paul's life and an attribute needed to meet the huge challenges confronting our world today. Although I want to underline that Fearless leadership is not just a quality we say others should have, global leaders, uh, leaders of countries, uh, whatever. Everybody, whatever their work of walk in life, has an opportunity to, uh, to practice it. And it, it's not my intention in the speech to talk about uh, attributes of fearless leadership, but more around the issues which require it in our world. But of course, I'm happy to opine on leadership at question time if anybody is uh, interested. Now, uh, I gave the lecture the title The Promise and Challenge of 2015 because this year is the biggest year in global development since Ben-Hur, if anyone else is old enough to remember Ben-Hur in the movie. And that's because uh, there are major global agendas being written this year, and they all relate to development. They need to be very bold and transformational uh, agend agendas because of the scale of the, the challenges. And these agendas matter a lot to New Zealand. 
as surely the future of our little country is so closely linked to the state of global peace and stability, global ecosystems, the global economy. Every country needs economies which can generate work for their people, particularly for today's largest ever generation of, of youth, a lot of whom don't have a lot to look forward to right now in rich countries and poor. Uh, we certainly need societies and political systems which are much more inclusive and cohesive than so many. We need healthy ecosystems, we need peace, and development plays a major role in advancing all of that, which is really rather why I like the job I'm doing at the UN Development Programme. So, to start by talking about some of these major global agendas that are being written, uh, 15 years ago, almost to the month, I went to New York for the Millennium Summit of the United Nations. And I signed on behalf of New Zealand the Millennium Declaration, and out of that came the Millennium Development Goals. And they've been guiding global development priorities uh, ever since. Well, they were always designed to have targets which ended at the end of this year. And so there's been a huge process going on globally uh, on what will be the design of the new agenda. And uh, the member states of the UN have determined that it will be a sustainable development agenda. There will be sustainable development goals, SDGs for short, uh, and they will be universal goals. And that really makes the point that development is not something that happens to somebody else, somewhere else, Actually, development, sustainable development, is something that is applicable to all countries. We all have a stake in it, and every country needs to do something to progress it. So in September this year, there will be, if you like, the successor summit to the Millennium Summit, uh, where the big declaration on sustainable development will be signed by leaders, as I signed 15 years ago, and these new sustainable development goals will be launched. But that's one of the four big processes for this year. The first was the third UN World Conference on Disaster Risk Reduction, which took place in Japan in March. And from UNDP, we went there with a message saying, if development isn't risk-informed, it can't be sustainable development. How can it be? Because if you risk losing everything, uh, because your country, your community, did not have the capacity or the resources to mitigate uh, the risk that you face uh, from disaster, then you, you can literally lose everything, as we saw uh, with people in Nepal on the 25th of April this year, as we saw in March, actually during the Sendai conference with Vanuatu and Cyclone uh, Pam. And of course, uh, the people of Christchurch in particular will empathise with what happened uh, in uh, Nepal. But let us acknowledge that the difference between the quake impact in Nepal or Haiti and in Christchurch, New Zealand, tough as it has been on the people of the city, is that New Zealand had made long-term investments in disaster risk reduction, and that is development, which is why we say the Disaster Risk Reduction Conference is so important to sustainable development. And we do see climate change uh, really raising the risk of weather-related disasters exponentially. Unplanned urbanisation is putting more and more people at risk of natural hazards in general, uh, both the weather-related and the seismic-related. Uh, and it's often the poor and vulnerable who are the most exposed to the risks. Uh, I have been to Haiti several times in this job, and one of the most humbling things is to go to the bottom of the ravines where the poorest of the poor live. They've come in from the countryside. Uh, people have populated down, down the gullies. They were always vulnerable to the big uh, weather bomb and the flooding coming down the gullies and flooding the, the houses at the lowest level. Uh, of course, when the earthquake came and uh, everything shook, the houses kind of cascaded down onto to each other. Very, very sad and, and, and tragic sight to, indeed. So the weather-related disasters getting worse, of course, links us into the third of the major processes this year, and that is the Climate Change Conference in Paris in December, where a new global treaty is due to be agreed. This is the one which it was 
agreed in Bali in late 2007 that there would be a new global agreement in Copenhagen in 2009. That did not happen. So uh, six years after that, the world is having another go. And as we speak, countries are filing with the UN what are called their uh, intended nationally determined contributions to reducing greenhouse gas emissions. The problem is that right now, the commitments that are being made do not add up to enough to stop reaching that tip over point of global warming exceeding two degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels, which we've always been told would lead to catastrophic and irreversible uh, climate change events. And uh, if that is the case, and we carry on as we are without good enough commitments, adding up to what must be done, then the typhoon high yarns and the cyclone PAMs uh, will become rather more routine than these terrible events today, as will the protracted droughts, which are also impacting on food production globally. Obviously, this matters a lot to New Zealand, which needs a temperate and equable climate for its agriculture to thrive. And it matters hugely to our small Pacific Island atoll nation neighbours, for which it's a, an existential threat. You may not be there at all if sea levels rise so much. So that's three of the big global agendas, disaster risk reduction, the sustainable development goals, the climate change uh, conference with the new treaty, we hope at the end of the year, and there's the fourth one on, on finance, which I'll come to in a moment. But you might ask, well, do these agendas actually matter? Well, my short answer is yes, they do. And when you look at uh, what has happened uh, since the Millennium Development Goals were uh, launched uh, early 2001, uh, areas like health, which were particularly targeted to reduce the uh, rate of infant, infant and child death, uh, to reduce maternal mortality, uh, and to uh, reduce mortality from HIV, malaria, and TB, uh, the Global Burden of Disease study strongly suggests that if you compare rate of progress against um, uh, reducing mortality in those areas before the effort that accompanied the MDGs and after, no question, we speed it up. We may not necessarily have met every target globally. Some countries certainly are nowhere near meeting the targets nationally. But there's more progress than there would have been, which more, means more people lived uh, and, and were not... Uh, uh, we're not dying from utterly uh, preventable uh, causes. But of course there is a lot of unfinished business from the agenda of 2000-2001. And uh, we see uh, as well that while, they, while it was a great vision and great goals, it never proposed to do the whole job. The, while the Millennium Declaration talks about eradicating uh, poverty, uh, the target that was set was to halve the proportion of people living in extreme poverty between 1990 levels and 2015. Well, that target was met by 2010, but it's not much fun being in the other half, which is a billion people uh, still living under the $1.25 uh, a day mark, for whom life has scarcely changed in many respects. And UNICEF, uh, UN Children's Fund, uh, has estimated that at the current rate of progress, 68 million more children under five will die from mostly preventable causes by 2030, and it would take almost 100 years before girls being born into sub-Saharan Africa's poorest families could expect to complete secondary schooling. So, for these and many other reasons, including the accelerated degradation of our ecosystems, we do need a much bolder sustainable development agenda which does aim to go to zero on eradication of extreme poverty and confront the many other global challenges, and I include in these, and I'll talk to them, uh, growing inequality and persistent discrimination against whole groups of people, uh, the jobs deficit and its implications, particularly for youth, the mounting environmental challenges, and of course the impact of our old enemies, conflicts and disasters. On inequality, which is rising in many countries, rich and poor, 
uh, our people estimate that 70% of the people living in developing countries live in societies which are less equal today than they were in 1990, 25 years ago. If we take a developed world example, the ILO, International Labour Organization, tells us that child poverty is rising in 18 of the 28 EU member countries. And they link that to falling levels of maternal and child benefits. The era of austerity has not been kind at all to social protection systems, and that has a cost in human life and, and health. But one of the defining features of this new sustainable development agenda is that it should, and I quote, leave nobody behind. I used to be fond of saying in public life here, the rising tide should lift every boat. That is the underlying philosophy behind the SDGs. But it does mean tackling entrenched inequalities relating to gender, ethnicity, and other factors. And on gender, inequality remains pervasive. Heaven knows why. If societies ignore the potential of half their population, how can they ever uh, really uh, fully uh, achieve? But around the world, where women, uh, where women are out of sight and out of mind, disempowered and underrepresented in decision-making circles, meeting their needs often just does not get prioritised. But we should take hope from examples of fearless leadership of women in many communities, not least in working for peace and recovery. This is a big UN agenda to have women's voices in peacemaking, peace building, uh, uh, every aspect of the, the peace process. And I also want to make special mention of the fearless leadership of Malala, who I think is a beacon of hope for girls around the world. She defied serious attacks on her life in Pakistan. She advocates globally for girls' education. And earlier this year, she spent her 18th birthday in Syria. I always marvel at the wisdom that comes from Malala, a teenage girl. She spent her birthday opening a school for displaced children in Syria, uh, which has been funded by her foundation. But she reminds us of the hopes and aspirations of another major global group uh, which is being excluded from opportunity in many cases. And that is this largest ever generation of adolescents and youth at 1.8 billion people, most of whom live in developing countries. Now, obviously, the energy, the hopes, the enthusiasm, innovation of youth can bring a huge demographic dividend to societies if societies invest in their youth. If they don't, you face a generation of unemployed, alienated and disengaged. And that is definitely not a recipe for peace and harmony. And uh, around our world, alas, we see young people disproportionately unemployed, even up to 50% levels in developed countries like Spain. And, and often lacking access to quality and affordable services, including sexual and reproductive health services. On inequalities, uh, we must also uh, mention that indigenous people continue to be adversely affected, including in our own society. Indigenous people have for centuries struggled to protect their ways of life and the fabric of their societies, and the new global agenda determined to leave no one behind must embrace indigenous communities as it must embrace communities around and minorities around the world. Including, of course, the LGBTI constituency, the lesbian, gay, transgender, bisexual, intersex uh, community. And it is really encouraging to me to see how the rights agenda for that community is now moving ahead so fast. Many countries are addressing the discrimination decisively, but in others, members of these communities continue to suffer from discrimination and very punitive laws. And it's important that that community, those communities, are not left behind in a global agenda either. So, reducing inequalities, I think number one on the big uh, global agenda. And it's not rocket science. It does require proactive policies and investments. 
in education and skills training and sexual and reproductive health services and availability of credit and all the services which widen opportunity. And it means commitment to inclusion in the economic, social and political spheres. It may require legislative and regulatory change. And I would hope New Zealand can advocate for such an agenda uh, globally. I've already commented on the, the, the challenge of the rapid pace of environmental degradation, which I think is extremely uh, serious. Uh, biodiversity loss uh, is, a is at a critical stage and our survival and well-being do depend very heavily upon the Earth's biodiversity. Uh, we see environmental sustainability and equity as very closely linked. Uh, and while climate change and deforestation and air and water pollution and biodiversity loss affect all of us, they do affect most the poorest and most vulnerable who uh, tend to uh, need to live or subsist off uh, the Earth's uh, Earth's natural resources. In 2011, UNDP produced a human development report on equity and sustainability. And it looked at scenarios of how uh, speeding up uh, or escalating environmental degradation would affect human development. And on the worst case scenario, which often appears quite likely, human development progress would slow to a crawl by the middle of this century and disproportionately so in sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia, which is surely not a future we want. So I do think some fearless leadership is required to tackle environmental degradation, and I know it's not easy. Having witnessed farmers' protests about, against being included in a carbon tax, who will ever forget MP Shane Ardern driving the tractor up the main steps of Parliament? Few people wanting to pay more for their petrol, and even objections to mandatory energy efficient light bulbs. But <laughs> countries have to act. Now, uh, coming to the, really the last of the major challenges I want to talk about, there can't be sustainable development without peace and stability. And the world has rather a large deficit on the peace and stability front at the moment. You see the humanitarian emergencies fueled overwhelmingly by war and conflict, uh, overwhelming the international community's capacity to respond. Believe it or not, humanitarian relief spending has trebled in the last decade, but there's still not enough, and there never will be enough. And I think at that point you have to say, please, could we try to reduce the demand? through support for building more inclusive and peaceful societies. Eight out of every $10 spent on meeting humanitarian needs is going to people caught up in these terrible conflicts. And the new global agenda has uh, something to say about that too, calling for peaceful and inclusive societies, access to justice for all, and accountable, inclusive and effective institutions. This would, of course, help a lot. The UN's Refugee Agency is now saying that 60 million people are displaced in the world, highest level since World War II. Around 20 million of them are officially classified as refugees. More people are on the move today than at any time since the United Nations was founded in 1945. They are coming from Syria, for example, where the conflict has resulted in 4 million people leaving the country and more than 7.6 million are displaced within Syria itself. This has sparked the largest humanitarian and development crisis of our times with serious impacts on the sub-region and beyond. And among those attempting these ghastly, desperate, dangerous and deadly journeys across the Mediterranean are many people fleeing the Syrian and other conflicts. I have spoken to Syrian refugees have, who have been sitting in camps for years. I can understand why people take those journeys. In fact, I think of one family I saw in a camp in Turkey at the end of April, and they were in a tent, mum and dad and four children. Dad had had his legs shot up and uh, being in the middle of a firefight uh, somewhere. And I said to him, as you do, I said, what do you do all day here? And he said, well, I get up in the morning, 
and I have breakfast with my family. Uh, the children go to the, the school and the camp. Uh, I go and have a coffee with my friends in the camp. We go to the mosque, we have another coffee, and then I come back to the tent. I said, and how long have you been in this tent? He said, three and a half years. Well, you know, you can understand why people try a desperate, dangerous journey. But of course, uh, people uh, fleeing across the Mediterranean are not only fleeing from conflict, terrible as that is, they're often fleeing from just plain poverty. And one of the saddest uh, figures I saw earlier this year, about April, May, was that at least 200 people from Senegal died in just one boat disaster in the Mediterranean in April. Now, Senegal has no instability since independence, but it is a low-income country with significant poverty, and people, young people in particular, are trying to find a, a better life. But, of course, on the other factors uh, of uh, war and conflict holding back development, we have the radical insurgents from Boko Haram to Al-Shabaab on the African continent, to Al-Qaeda and IS in the Middle East, who make life absolutely unbearable for those on whom they prey. In Yemen, we have the major airstrikes, shelling and fighting, which has put 80% of the country's 25 million people in need of humanitarian relief. In South Sudan, there's been 19 months of conflict, which has contributed to huge food insecurity. More than 40% of the population face hunger. Ukraine, another example, there are an estimated 1.3 million internally displaced people, which puts a lot of strain on the host communities. One could go on. There are many more conflicts. So against this backdrop, it's not surprising that appeals for humanitarian relief have gone into the stratosphere. Hence the time to be asking some fundamental questions. Humanitarian needs do not have to increase forever. How could we collectively act to stem the tide and reverse the current trends? And I think that is intrinsically a development question. Humanitarian needs will shrink when and where long-term sustainable development based on peaceful and inclusive societies is achieved. And that is exactly what one of the sustainable development goals is about. Now, I think uh, New Zealand can lead in this area. Our country has a reputation for being fair-minded and wanting to contribute to resolution of the world's problems. Investing in what might prevent them in the future is important too. And if we could achieve the sustainable development goal on peaceful and inclusive societies, the conflicts we see destroying lives and hopes and driving so many of these desperate and dangerous journeys to other lands, one would hope could become a thing of the past in our lifetimes. So let us come to implementation of this complex new agenda, taking on all these challenges. The best agendas are nothing more than words on a piece of paper, unless you can do something about them. So what's the good news? Well, the good news is that the world has more wealth, more knowledge, more technology than ever before to do something about the challenges. The challenges we face are mostly human-induced. We can tackle them, but not if we keep doing business as usual and expecting to get different results. So we do need, on the environmental side, radical adjustments in the way we are living and working and consuming and transporting ourselves, designing our cities, uh, uh, powering our, our homes and, and our industry. Uh, there is a lot of capacity to be built uh, in developing countries and beyond. Governance needs to improve. Sweeping policy, legislative and regulative changes are needed. And we do need that commitment to lasting peace and stability. And we need leadership in a number of key respects on implementation. Firstly, money. It isn't everything, but it always helps, including through official development assistance. But I want to put official development assistance, overseas aid, in perspective when it comes to implementing global agendas. Last year, this ODA, official development assistance, came to $135.2 billion. The UN Conference on Trade and Development, UNCTAD, has forecast that to achieve the new SDGs in key sectors by 2030, 
would require 3.3 to 4.5 trillion dollars to be invested every year. So if you divide 135 billion into 3.3 to 4.5 trillion and get all the noughts right, you'll see that it is a small proportion of what is required. Uh, and that is all the more reason, by the way, for what is spent on this ODA to be smart and to be effective. And it should absolutely be focusing on supporting countries to build the capacities they need to grow in inclusive and sustainable ways, uh, to uh, get domestic resource mobilization from their growth and improve uh, their capacity to trade and to attract loans of quality and investment of quality. Uh, ODA could also very usefully focus on how to reduce that demand for the great humanitarian uh, needs which I've described, uh, to support countries to emerge from conflict and get back on track for development. We have to see now risks of disaster, conflict and disease outbreaks. Let's not forget Ebola. These are the norm, not the exception. And we need to plan for, understand and finance around these risks. We've done a calculation that for every $100 spent on development aid, 40 cents goes into protecting that development from disaster. So with trillions to be spent on infrastructure between now and 2030, the end date of the SDGs, it is really vital to bring that risk-informed perspective uh, to development uh, spending. And then in terms of smart and catalytic uh, spending, hard as it is, complex as it, as it is, we certainly need more investment in building the foundations of peace and stability, better quality governance, and inclusive and sustainable development in very challenging contexts. Now, on financing, I said I'd mention a fourth major global event this year. There was the third international conference on financing for development in Ethiopia, uh, held in July. And it set a new framework around financing. In many ways, it catches up with the reality that most development is financed through domestic resource mobilization. Uh, but you have to have capacities to mobilize domestic resources, like tax. And one of the initiatives we launched there was uh, with the OECD, and it's called Tax Inspectors Without Borders, <laughs> because you will appreciate that there are many global companies that specialize in paying tax to nobody. And many countries do not have the skills in their tax departments to get anywhere near what they might be owed. And so under this new initiative, uh, we will be drawing tax audit experts from wherever, could be from countries in the south, could be countries in the north, to work alongside tax authorities in developing countries to help them gain the skills, transfer the skills, to assess and collect the tax they should be being paid by international uh, companies. Uh, so there's a lot more one could say about Addis Ababa, but generally quite a, a progressive conference on financing. Uh, secondly, on implementation, we do need very broad coalitions uh, behind implementation. Governments acting alone cannot achieve the goals that are set out in the new global agenda. Uh, government leadership, of course, is very important, but it's insufficient. Broader leadership is required, and that includes leadership from civil society. Our NGOs, our scientists, our researchers, academia, local government role is very, very critical too. And as well, we need the private sector engaged because how business does business and where it invests has such a huge bearing on whether we will ever achieve sustainable development. Uh, we need a commitment from business to go beyond the relatively small scale social uh, corporate responsibility uh, projects and into genuine commitments around shared value, the inclusion of micro-enterprise and SMEs and value chains, and environmentally sustainable uh, development. We need new business models, in short. Now, being an optimist, I look at what is happening in the palm oil sector, a major commodity sector at the moment. Vast areas of the world's tropical forest have been cleared for palm oil production over many years. However, up to 
of the buying uh, power of palm oil now has signed up to implementing deforestation-free supply chains. This is a huge thing. And it really supports developing country governments which are trying to regulate and stop deforestation. Because if the major buyers, 90% of the major buyers, and we'd like to get to 100, are saying, don't even bother clearing that forest because we will not buy your product. And if that's reinforced by consumers saying, well, even if you did, we wouldn't buy your soap, then you really get a very powerful coalition between governments, consumers, uh, private sector. So these things can be done. Uh, this is a, a stream of action on climate which uh, UNDP led uh, for the uh, climate summit at the UN uh, last year. And we would now like to see this approach taken with palm oil go into other areas of production like soy and beef. A lot of uh, tropical forest is, is cleared uh, for those forms of production too. And I think, again, this is an agenda New Zealand can lead on. Uh, this country did stop the destruction of native forest on all its, its public lands. Uh, we do have something to say about these things. So, to come back to the underlying principles of the new agenda, it is as relevant to a developed country like New Zealand as it is to a least developed country. Of course, there are very different starting points, but everybody needs to be on board. Uh, on areas like climate change, the poorest and most vulnerable countries have contributed the least to the problem, but they do bear the brunt of the consequences. And that is a reason why developing countries to this day take a very strong line on what is called a common but differentiated responsibility, CBDR, approach to climate change. They say, you people have contributed the most to this problem historically, you should do the most about it now. And I think developed countries should embrace that leadership role. Uh, if that leadership is shown, and if there's greater support for developing countries to make a transition to a green economy, then I think developing countries too will lift their level of ambition on greenhouse gas emissions reduction and sustainable development uh, pathways. So uh, we need leadership on funding. We need leadership uh, from, from governments, private sector, all aspects of the society. We also need leadership out of the uh, multilateral system, and that in includes the, uh, obviously the whole UN uh, common system. And I could uh, say quite a lot about UNDP's role in that, which is quite important because UNDP is not only a very substantial global program in its own right, but it has also historically been mandated by the General Assembly to lead the whole UN development system and coordinate it. So we do have a, a special role. And uh, one of the most important tasks we have now is uh, working with developing countries on how to incorporate this new sustainable development agenda and goals into national development agendas. And countries are not hanging back. It's not a question of saying, oh, heavens, if they agree that in New York. There is a huge amount of ownership in this agenda because the countries have negotiated it themselves. And they are coming to us before we even knock on the door uh, to say, we're redoing our national development plan now. How do we get the goals into it? So this is really extremely uh, encouraging. And we're, we're working very closely with that process. So to come to a conclusion, uh, I really do see this as a once in a generation year for development. The new global disaster risk reduction agenda is in place. We have a good outcome, I think, on the framework of financing for development reached last month. I think there will be a new agreement on tackling climate change, but it needs to be more ambitious than we're seeing at the moment. Uh, and then, of course, we have the, the major SDG agenda being launched in, in September. But sustainable development will remain elusive and global instability and turbulence will continue to undermine people's prospects if business as usual continues, as this volatility really is the new normal. So we have to acknowledge the realities of the world we live in and have earlier, more proactive, more preemptive investment in risk-informed development. Uh, 
We need to tackle ha head on the growing inequalities and unchecked discrimination, which are undermining social cohesion around our world. We have to tackle environmental degradation, including to our climate decisively. And we really have to work much harder on stopping this downward spiral into conflict, instability, crisis, and despair. It's often said that ours is the last generation which could, if it had the will, head off the worst effects of climate change. It's also the first generation with the know-how and the wealth globally to eradicate global poverty if it wants to and to secure a more hopeful future. And we're going to need some fearless leadership for that. But I think if collectively countries and communities do step up around this huge opportunity of writing the big new agendas in 2015, then there is a chance of achieving more sustainable development and with it, I hope, better prospects for all people and our planet. Thank you. Thank you.